Hello, everybody, and my name is Ruth Bruss, and welcome. I work for both Meteor Education and for the Center for College and Career Readiness. And thank you so much for attending today's session on student engagement, hitting a brick wall. For our time together, I'm gonna to focus on how we might measure engagement really in preparation for understanding learning readiness. I'm gonna share engagement research that we have collected at the center, why student engagement is so important for learning and really talk about two engagement measurement tools that we've discovered called Rhythm and Anira. One measures engagement readiness of our students and the other measures the engagement during learning situations in real time. So let's begin by coming together to have a common understanding of what engagement is. For so many educators, engagement looks like this. And if you look at this slide, you can see we think of engagement. And when I ask educators around the country, how do you know students are engaged? I usually get one or two or three of these answers. The eyes are up, they're smiling, the students are quiet, focused, they're participating, they're contributing or collaborating with the students. However, if this is the only thing that we are really focused on when we think about student engagement, it's really a narrow view because it only focuses on what we can see of a student when we're visually looking at students. And I believe we really all know students that might check all these boxes. Their eyes are up, they're smiling, they're quiet. But by the end of the day, they're not really finding success. So are they really truly engaged or are they just compliant? To view engagement only through the lens of instruction or that cognitive realm, the stuff you see, we can often miss out on the other realms that keep our students focused and engaged. We have the emotional realm and the physical realm. And these are the things we can't see. And without understanding them, we often hit a brick wall when it comes to really student engagement. We have to consider both the emotional and the physical realms to, in order to help us differentiate not just our instruction, but really what our student connections are with us, with others, and with the content, and really focus on that physical space as well. For example, if you see that a child is being bullied or having some outside trauma, you don't always see that. And that's that emotional realm that can keep them disengaged. Or does the student need to be in a physical space that has more natural light? That's that physical realm to really keep them focused as well. So I want you to think about engagement in that it is all three and all three must be considered. The cognitive realm, the emotional realm, and the physical realm. This is data from Child Trends, and these are some of the brick walls that our students might hit in the emotional realm. And I'm gonna focus a lot on the emotional realm today. Those unseen barriers or baggage that students bring to the table, and they can often make a difference really in the engagement levels if a student's participating or even if they're learning. And we've all heard of ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experiences. We know that some of the ACEs can include students of poverty, students that come to school hungry or abused or are being bullied. Um, even a childhood experience where a child feels that a teacher doesn't like them. Those are all considered adverse childhood experiences. And from this slide, you can see that generally in the United States, the percentage of students that have zero to eight ACEs is somewhere around 45% in a standard classroom. So if you think about that, in an average class of 28 students, six students would have two or more adverse childhood experiences and three students would have ongoing, ongoing weekly trauma. Overall, on average, 14 students in a classroom of 28 would have experienced trauma in their childhood. Among struggling learners, you can double these data points. These are the things that are in the minds of our students that usually have nothing to do with us as educators yet it keeps them from being engaged. We have to have some kind of a measurement stick to really be able to address these issues because these can become those brick walls that really are barriers for our student learning. What research has shown us is that there are three different engagement connections. We have the relational, how do I relate to my peers or teachers? cognitive engagement and my understanding what I, I need to learn and why I need to learn it. Like, am I making a connection to that content? And agentic engagement where students have voice and choice. 
When we consider all three of these and they're all addressed, we believe at Meteor that we can truly accelerate and accelerate, move it along quicker because of these adverse childhood experiences. We can accelerate learner engagement. So I want you to look at this graphic for a minute and we call this our engagement flywheel. And if you know anything about a flywheel, once it gets started, it just continues to move on its own. You really don't have to restart it, it just keeps going. And our fly reel shows that our entry point in engagement is really at the relational piece. That is the start that we as educators have to begin to get the flywheel of engagement going. We have to begin by building relationships. This will establish the momentum that we need. Once students begin to embrace those relationships and those connections, then and only then can we really move on to cognitive engagement and finally to agentic engagement. So as the engagement connections increase, we know that the flywheel takes on its own life, it accelerates and it goes faster and faster. But again, it all starts with the relational piece. We have to have students feel that they are safe in their classrooms, they have relationships with their peers, with their teachers and with their students. I wanna take a deeper dive because we wanna talk about the barriers, but I wanna I want to take a deeper dive into, three, into these three aspects so you can see a little bit about what the difference is. But again, I went, I'm gonna be coming back to this flywheel. I want you to think about, we're going to start with that relational piece. So what is the relational engagement? Now, all three of these are connections. This is a connection to people, to the learning experience, to the ideas, to the learning environment, anything that influences enhances or really promotes a willingness and ability of, and, an, and an ability to develop and learn. Some of the things we would note here if we're looking for, for a relational engagement is that we're looking for students that have positive relationships with their teachers, with other um, school adults, outside adults, even bus drivers, anybody, their peers. They can work well with others. They're not like that loner all the time, always by themselves. They be truly believe that teachers and school adults care about them and they feel valued as part of community. Really, the relationship is so important because we have to start with the heart, not the head. Now, I want you to think about that. Start with the heart, not the head. We have to have students know that we care for them and, the, then, and that the experiences that we're creating for them as educators, we really want these experiences to resound for them and then to find their passion in school. But we have to first let them know that we're there for them and that they can feel safe and secure in the environment. So again, going back to that flywheel, we start with that relational engagement. The cognitive engagement is the connection to the ideas, the content, or the tasks that we're creating. We know that learning by doing really can equal success and there are natural consequences and even challenges and mistakes can really enhance our learning, but it, we learn from our mistakes. Students that are really at that cognitively level engagement are immersed in their learning experiences. They really foster rigor, perseverance and relevance and resilience. They're able to self-evaluate, reflect. They have personal accountability and ownership of their learning experiences and really have self-efficacy and the belief in their own abilities. Now, if I, I, have, if I were to ask a, a principal or a teacher, which of these two, now I've only talked about two so far, relational engagement or cognitive engagement, which one do we focus the most on? Most of the teachers that I talk to say cognitive engagement. We talk about the experiences that we create in the classroom. But again, going back to the flywheel, you gotta start with the heart. You gotta start with that relationship. These might be the best tasks that you've created at the cognitive level. The, the point I'm trying to make here is that students cannot become engaged in something that they're really not interested in or that they have too many other things, extraneous things getting in the way of their learning. So we have to focus and take those out of the picture first so these experiences can really hit home for them and really help them to find their passion. And finally, agentic um, engagement is really where students have agency to engage in a task. So the, they're connected to a task. They can actively participate in the, le the lesson really by constructing their own learning. They ask questions about the content. They're able to um, enhance learning by asking for feedback. Um, we don't see a lot of kids asking for feedback. We give them feedback, but they actually are asking, they're begging for you, they're salivating for that, that information. And they're able to express their preferences and their opinions related to a lesson, agree, disagree. Um, really supporting with that, being able to have conversations about the content. 
So again, all three, all three of these connections really truly encompass student engagement and they have to be considered by educators. And again, what I tend to see the most is that cognitive engagement, but we don't want to, to leave out that relational or that agentic. And because the relationship is so important, I wanted to share some, some research to, sh to share that I'm not making this up, that this is truly something that we really need to focus on. Here's a study that um, was talking about social and emotional intelligence, that it impacts cognitive intelligence, that we know that retention and application can be impaired by deficits in social and emotional intelligence. So we have to focus on that social and emotional in order to really get to that intellectual or cognitive intelligence. Here's another one, uh, another research. I absolutely love this research from Lou Cozzolino. He's a professor of psychology at Pepperdine University. And he contends and he shared that it, the brain is social and it needs relationships to survive. And without relationships, the brain can literally shrink. And I think that's interesting to think without relationships, the brain can shrink. And I think what keeps coming up to my mind as I'm looking at this study is thinking about what's going on in, with this pandemic with COVID-19 and so many of our adults that are sitting in nursing homes and they uh, don't have relationships. And we hear that on the news all the time that they're lonely. Their brains are literally shrinking. They need that. What he has found is that strong relationships stimulate positive emotions and in the absence of those strong relationships, stress takes hold and it's difficult to have a healthy boundaries that keep adult worries among adults and allow children to focus on child appropriate worries. So what he's saying there is that our children are so focused because of this, this re, no relationships, they start, to be, they start to think like adults, but they're not ready to think like adults, they don't know how to. So it becomes stressful for them. Go back to that flywheel. It begins with the relationship. Your brain can literally be hijacked. And this is not just for students, this is for anyone. Any kind of stressful situation literally can hijack your, your brain. It's called the amygdala hijack. And keep in mind, it's not that your students don't want to learn, they literally cannot learn. Our reptilian brain shuts down and keeps us from really being engaged. Again, that's another one of those brick walls that we can't see. And this is a study from UCF, and this is really what happens to students in those high stress situations, which we have so many students right now in those because of the COVID, just trying to figure out, you know, they're worried about parents, what's going to happen with their work, their next meal, all those various things, even the, where they're going to live. If you look at this, you can see the spectrum of cognitive abilities. And at the, at the top, you can see in the blue, um, at the left, low stress. So what you know is that most of us process an average of seven messages per communication episode. And most of us as adults can process an average grade level of about 10th grade. However, they found that when we are at high stress um, levels, we can only process three messages per communication episode. And on average, we can be down four grade levels in our general understanding of, of, of processing information. And I think this is really telling I work with, as I said, a lot of our teachers are really burnt out and they're stressed. And, and when I think about this study, I think that we've got to be careful that we're not overwhelming them because they really can only process a certain amount. But they've taken this and think about this. If this is what way the adults are, are dealing and handling stress, your students are doing the same thing. So they're all processing at a lower level. They're not able to um, but process it at where there might be just a minimum of confusion. It's okay to have some confusion or a misunderstanding or misinterpretations and stuff, but when it's constant, that diminishes. And remember, it's that amygdala hijack. We lose, we lose our perception to be able to even understand what someone's saying at that given moment. So we really, as humans, can comprehend fewer messages per those communication episodes and process information at a level below our normative grade level. And that is all really dependent upon our stress levels. And so what we know is stress could be a barrier for student learning. And we all are familiar. I, I put up here Maslow's hierarchy and our goal, and we learned about this when I was in the College of Education, is moving from really that physiological state where it's all about our essential needs, where self-transcendence, where we're really about the spirituality and real, real realization, being able to the universe and ourselves to others. What is our relationship to others? I share this because I want you to think about 
we cannot assume that just because a student has one relationship, one relationship with just one adult, that that's going to really make all the difference. We've got to really build in all of the things that really for that social and emotional learning in order to get that engagement will started, that flywheel started. Because think about it. How can a student really move up when they're hungry or when they're scared, or when they're being bullied? And again, those are the brick walls that we often face. So what I know and what you probably know is that there are certain skills that students need to learn. And we got to focus on those first before we go into the cognitive realm. We got to focus on these before we worry about the stuff. The, I always say the stuff, the math, the reading, that we need them to understand that social emotional learning. We got to bypass these brick walls. And if we're beginning with relational engagement, these are some of the skills. If you notice, these are two um, areas that we often find these skills. There's a lot of other ones as well, but most education, most of you would probably be familiar with the CASEL framework and the big five domains um, from OECD. Both of these frameworks are aligned and really support the skills students need in order to be successful in school and even throughout life. They center around really goal setting for students. If you notice on the CASEL one in the middle, it's that social emotional learning. And then around that it's on learning self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, social awareness, self-awareness, and then it moves out from there. And then on the big five domains, you can look around from that, you can see the task performance, emotional regulation, collaboration, all of those skills that helps students to be successful. These are the first skills that they have to learn. And I want you to keep in mind as educators, they're not going to often learn these in their home. I'm not saying they're not gonna learn some of them, but even, even if you come from a, 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 a non, a pretty functional uh, home, you're still gonna have some things that you can only learn by being around others, being around your peers. So again, remember, we have to be deliberate in focusing on these skills in our classroom. I'm gonna share another piece of research. I love research. And all of, by the way, all of these slides, I'll be happy to send to you at the end of the presentation. This is a really interesting study. This was done with um, a study for disadvantaged three and four-year-olds, and they were put into two groups. And one of the groups and, uh, was given a program where they had weekly home visits, and they really focused on learning various social skills and how to work with others. So they were very specific with this group, um, and that's the light bl blue group here in the data. The other group just had regular schooling and, and such. And so um, they did not get all of that social and emotional thing. So what they did is they came back and looked at these, um, this group um, and they followed this group until the age of 40. So you're talking about three and four year olds all the way to the age of 40. And what you can see is that the inter they found that it turned out that the intervention did not have any lasting effect on children's cognitive skills. I, find, I think that's interesting. They weren't, it didn't make a difference if they learned those social emotional skills to help with their cognitive. However, it did improve their, um, their social emotional skills in, um, and led to a substantially better life and a better outcome of their life. And I thought that was very interesting. And you can look over to the right-hand side here. You can see, okay, so we're looking at graduate from high school, graduated. But if you go down to quality of life, like um, for example, raise their own children, males that raise their own children, you almost have probably about 55% of males that raise their own children that if that were part of the, pro, um, the group that had the intervention and only 30%, so almost doubled that it's uh, the students that were taught those social emotional skills were actually had a better quality of life and they were changing the trajectory of their own family, generational poverty and all of those various things. Using sedatives or sleeping pills, you find that those that did not have those social skills were using them on, uh, well over double the amount of um, those that had the program. Arrested five times by age 40. So you can see that there's definitely a, a, a factor in there. So that is just, if, if you're looking for that data to really support that we have got to take a look at what's happening with our students, with our ACEs and what they're coming to school with, those brick walls that are really keeping them from really learning we have to really think about how we're, what kind of program are we gonna put in place to help them to build those social and emotional skills. And I wanna round out this section by just sharing, this was another piece of work. And I think this would be pretty self-explanatory, but you can see they followed high school dropouts that did not receive a GED diploma. Um, students that did receive their GED um, and then regular high school graduates. 
And what they found is regular high school graduates had both the social emotional skills needed and the cognitive skills, and they had a better outcome of quality of life versus those that didn't get that social and emotional skills at the school. I think that's pretty self-evident. However, it, again, we have to be deliberate in our practices, in our schools, that we're going to go over those skills and really help our students to understand what they mean and how to apply them. Student engagement is an outcome of social, emotional, and cognitive skills. It is a discrete neurological state and emotion is closely linked to engagement. And to really put it simply, and this is one of my, our favorite sayings at Meteor, is that it is literally neurobiologically impossible to think deeply about things that you don't care about. So you can't really care about something if you're so in the moment of just trying to get through the day and hope that you're gonna have a place to put, put your head at night or you're gonna have enough food or substance or your parents are gonna be home when you get home. So you cannot, literally cannot be, be worried about those cognitive things. Again, it's about relationships. So I'm gonna walk you through now a series of slides and you'll see some more data as well that shows you at, at the center, we're always looking for tools and we research out there. And we found this really cool tool that measures student ready, readiness to learn and really looking at that emotional realm. Because keep in mind, we can't see that. We can see those things when students are facing forward and such, but we cannot see really what's inside of a student. Somehow we have to pull that out. And Rhythm helps to do that. This is a tool and what it does is students have to answer five questions and they can do this more than once a day. These are emoji based questions and it's kind of a check in for students and the the intent of the authors of the that created this tool was that they wanted students to be able to know that they weren't ready for to learn and then they could learn to self regulate. What they have found though, that this tool's even gone deeper than that, where now teachers can look at that data. They know in the moment data that they know in real time, students that are ready to learn and those that really do need to pull aside and maybe help them to, to get through. They're not ready. We've got to go back to the relationship. They're not ready for the cognitive. We've got to go back to the relationship. So we have to maybe differentiate our instruction, the connection or the experience that we have with those. This is a, again, a one minute measurement and it gets, helps us get past those brick walls. And I'm just gonna show you what the five questions are. This, this is the, and the kids just answer them. It's just emoji. They just click on the emoji, the best um, represents. We, I, I've, I've been working um, and with a couple of districts that have purchased this, just asking them how they're finding and using the data. They said it's been very easy for younger kids because of the, the emojis, which are universal language, very easy for everyone to understand. Um, and for the high school students, they are so used to using them that um, it's been a win-win for them all the way around. So the first question is about your mental status. What's it like in your head today? And it's remember, it can, these mental focus can always be symptoms of hunger, illness, injury, sadness. We don't really know. Energy and focus are really those variables in that, that are really important for us to consider when we're adjusting our instruction and really our interaction to our students who showed up in the classroom. So they have to decide what it's like in their head today. Second question is about their energy. How is your energy today? And remember that energy is really critical for the element for self-regulation because this tool is to help the students self-regulate. Are they ready to learn? Awareness of your energy state can help you either energize or calm yourself. For example, if you came to school with, and you drank five monster drinks, you might be super out of control and the data is going to tell you that as a student, that is going to tell you that as a teacher, and then we can make some adjustments as necessary. The emotional status, how do you feel today? And remember, emotional status can be different at the beginning of the day, that can, um, but it can also be different based on what's happening during the, throughout the day. So that's why what I like about this tool, um, we have a lot of middle schools that I have visited that are using these at for each of the classroom periods that the students are in to see how they're um, feeling, how is how are they self-regulating throughout the day? Because a lot happens to teenagers, um, even young kids throughout the day when they're interacting with their peers and such. Physical health, how does your body feel today? This is all about creating a culture of caring. You wanna be proactive in your check-in and really ensure that this, the student self-reports for illness, injury, or hunger. And then finally, the last question is, how's your social life going today? So bad, meh, good, great, disagreement, um, conflict. 
We know that social connection indicators have the greatest impact on our adolescents. And in a digital environment, you know that cyberbullying can be visible, invisible, and really deadly. So we this really helps us to understand that. Are there conflicts with parents? Are there is there abusive behaviors and so on? These five questions were developed by clinicians really to determine a child's social and emotional state and really to determine if they are ready to learn and what for that engagement level. And then, as I share with you, Based on a student's answers, they get a personalized activity to help them to self-regulate. It could be a calming activity if they're super hyper, an activity, maybe they're not focused, an activity that helps them to focus, a movement activity, such as here you see a yoga pose or something to kind of get them stretching or going. There's visualizations, there's like 80, 90 different things here that can come out. It's all in the algorithm behind the answers to the questions. All of these are aligned to the castle um, skills that I shared with you just a few minutes ago. And the cool thing, as I shared, is that educators also get this information for each student. And this will allow you to know precisely how to respond to instruction, the environment, or a given lesson. Because remember, students can't be truly engaged if they hit that brick wall. And we want to make them, we want to help them either get around it or get through it. And it's all based on the theory of self-regulation. I remember this from when I was in um, as a teacher, and those about the colors that really helped de depict the low to high data and where a student is for the day or even for a class period if they should do it um, periodically throughout the day. One of the other things, and there's a variety of analytics and stuff, I'm not gonna go into that. You can see the um, districts have purchased this and um, they can get every um, every school and, and make comparisons on schools. You, um, we have one state that's using it here. You can see that is comparing all across the um, state by zip code and such. One thing I thought was really interesting, I wanted to share this with you, is this is kind of a student response at a school level. And you can see that um, here in the red here, it's um, emotional happy. And you can see the orange, 71% said they were happy um, in orange and 84% said they were happy in blue. The interesting thing is, is the blue are the students and the orange are our teachers. And I, I thought that's really interesting. Our students are, were happier at this school than our teachers were. And if you look at the next slide here, you can see anxious. We have 7% of our students are anxious, 25% of teachers are anxious. What a lot of schools are doing is they're having teachers do this as well. Kind of a self-check for yourself because teachers are also feeling the effects of everything that's going on. We have to, we can't forget we're human too. So with everything with the COVID and really the responsibility of keeping our students focused, we need to self-regulate ourselves as well. So really, this is really important that we have this data for ourselves as teachers and we have a lot of schools that are using that as well. So what we know is that self-regulation needs to be learned by both the students and the teacher. And we know that the stronger you become um, with, with self-regulation practice. It's not just about how you are doing, but what's up. I would be remiss if I didn't share how COVID had us also heightened the need for the self-regulation here. Students are showing a great concern for returning to school with heightened anxiety. And you can see that two thirds of teens are concerned about returning to school. So we've got to help them again, we're gonna to have to pull back a little bit on that cognitive realm, worrying about all the experiences that have to do with our standards and maybe focus on that relational piece, really getting our students really in that social emotional realm. It's really important that we understand our students needs are, and especially going back to even if we're not gonna see them face to face. We did a study at the Center for the College and Career, um, College and Career Readiness and we did a study of 7,500 students and we asked them many, many questions and I can get you this report if you'd like. Um, and it's really interesting. One of the questions we asked students is, I connect online with my teacher every day. And these were the answer that we got. And you can see that almost 59% said not so much. So where's that connection? They're 59% are not even connecting to their teacher. So if they're not connecting with their teacher, the concern is they're not connecting with anybody. They're just by themselves. This is what we're seeing with all this mental and what we're worried about as educators. Another question we, question we asked them is I work at home online each day for, and we gave them um, options, less than an hour, one to two hours, two to three, three to four, four plus. You can see that 70% of our students said that they work online for less than um, three hours or less. And that's a concern when we know that typically they're in a school day for six and a half hours a day or more. 
and they're not even online that amount. Now I get it. It's hard to be online. It can get really tedious. I live on Zooms and I know sometimes it's like, whew, I need, I need a, I need a moment away from it all. But we don't have a choice. That's what our that's what our given is right now. So we have to ensure that our students are there. Um, so we really talk about from this study that it's really important again to go back, create those personal connections, have some conversation with your students, really think about that self-awareness regulation and really create some structures and planning. And one of the things we did is we really said, we believe that what gets scheduled gets done. So you can see here's an example schedule about giving time for the relationship building throughout a given day. So this was an example of an online classroom from 815 to 315, long day, we know it, but in between you're getting some physical, you're getting some, some relational opportunities, time to to do some things to get yourself into that mode. Remember, going back to that flywheel, we have to have the relationship relationship first before we really can focus in on uh, the cognitive learning. I, I just share with you Rhythm, which is a tool that measures student readiness to learn and to be engaged. But the opposite of this emoji platform is a tool that truly measures engagement. And this is like cutting edge. This is so new that we only have a couple schools that are using it right now. Um, because it's just so cool. But this is a called immersion and it's a wearable wristwatch. It's similar to a Fitbit that measures really the neurobiological response of what is happening at any given time. And we all know that when we're immersed in something, we remember something. So how many of you remember the space shuttle disaster? You probably remember that. So you probably had a spike in some of the chemicals in your brain, the oxytocin, the love drug, or the cortisol, which is the stress drug. And this allowed you to be engaged in the moment and to retain the information. So this kind of Fitbit watch, what it does is it really measures those levels and along with your heart rate and all of this stuff that's really sciency. And it helps them to see if you're truly engaged. It began and was, it was um, created for military training um, for um, armies that had to go into villages and to see how fast they could get engaged with the, um, with the villagers. It uh, was also used in media where um, looking at commercials and movies, how long did student, um, the audience stay engaged? Where, were the, where did engagement peak? Where did it kind of lag? And all of this was put together for this and media education kind of thought this was the coolest thing and said, engagement is so important to us with that accelerate engagement. We could really use this to evaluate curriculum and instruction to determine if where are we creating those kinds of tasks that are truly engaged? Are students really engaged in it at that moment? So we worked with Paul Zach, the creator of Immersion. We renamed it Anira. And it really is helping to work with schools and reading the classroom narrative on are your students really, are they really truly engaged? Are the, is there blah factor where they're not really points in your lessons where they're not engaged? Who's engaged? Who's ready? Who's got that wow factor that they're um, engaged more so than others? What we have found is really interesting in some of the classrooms that, and as I said, it's so cutting edge. We've only worked with a couple schools and stuff. Um, we have found that interesting enough, some of the students that we didn't think would be truly the ones engaged are the ones that were the most immersed in the education. And we could only tell this by looking at the data from this little tool. Think back to the very first slide I share with you. Typically when we ask teachers, how do you know if a student is engaged? You would say, they're looking at me, all of those things. Well, this student wasn't doing any of that. So tip, we would have been like, that child's not engaged at all. However, it's just that that was the personality of the child, but yet they were truly engaged based on this. Then we had conversations with the student and it was very interesting. They said, I'm always engaged. I'm just really shy. And so you got it. There's so many factors that about engagement that we don't always know what our students really are feeling. We don't really know if they are truly engaged. We have to look at those things all the way around. And the tool, this one really aligns to the big five domains because I shared the other one, Rhythm is really about the castle. This one is about the um, looking at the big five do domains. And lastly, one of the other research pieces that I wanted to share um, just is, there was some questions that were asked of 1.6 million students in the United States. And it says, what is likely impact on student learning as a result of shifting school at home? Because we're really concerned about that with the COVID-19. And where do we see success with this shift? What we have found is that students without access to meaningful instruction after the school closures were 
probably could lose up to 49% of their potential growth by the start of next school year. So we're still in this 2019, 2020. Now we're in 2020, we haven't gotten out of this, that we have updated this data and I can get you the, the um, more recent data. But what we're finding is about five months of lost learning. It also found some other things that 76% of schools showed decreased instructional activity after the closures of COVID-19. Worst case prediction for a wide widening of the achievement gap is gonna be about 18%. Because you know we we always look and trying to decrease that achievement gap. We know that struggling readers are on track to fall behind their peers by an additional six percent, not not just six percent, an additional six percent. But we did find that some districts are succeeding with online learning. They have some great um, things that they're doing, and they have been successful to some to some degree. So it's a great study. We can get that for you if you're interested in that. So what we know is that we're all kind of in that crisis learning. We know that there's this, there, this crisis learning, this distress learning, we retain less. And again, we've got to come back to building the relationships so that we can at least get that piece in place so the cognitive will follow, that flywheel. And if you think about accelerated learning and engagement, that flywheel, we know that if we focus on those relationships first, then we can truly move our students to that cognitive and agentic connections. And this is not something that's just, you know, oh, this is the great thing that it happens. It really aligns to John Hattie's visible learning, which we are all very familiar with, um, because his top three are teacher expectations of students, teacher self-confidence, and student self-confidence, all the things that really build on to the social emotional realm. We can really truly break down the wall for students when we focus on instruction on all three realms, that cognitive realm, that emotional realm, the physical round, really focusing in on that flywheel and the three different types of engagement. So my question for you as educators today is what's it like in your head today? How is your energy today? How do you feel today? How does your body feel today? And how's your social life going today? Remember, you have to focus on yourself first, then your student needs. Remember that engagement begins with the relationships and that we can measure that unseen data through tools such as Rhythm and Nira. And finally, we can truly determine if students are immersed in the content. We can see that they've moved beyond the relational engagement to the cognitive and ultimately to agentic engagement by really measuring in real time their neurobiological responses. There's lots of things out there. There's lots of data. I'd be happy to share a lot with you if you have other questions about this. Thank you so much for attending today's session. Um, in a minute, I'll see if there's any questions. But in the meantime, if you'd like to write down my email address, rbruss at Meteor Education, or my colleague, Kim Bolzer, kbolzer at meteoreducation.com, we reach out to us and we'll be happy to provide you any additional information that you have. And again, I want to thank you for taking the time to share um, with us this afternoon, and hopefully you've learned something new or something has been validated for you.